thank you very much for inviting me to present this study to you here on behalf of our network of investigators. Uh, we were with a collaborative team of emergency, critical care, anesthesia, and uh, neurology researchers. Um, uh, the study was principally funded by the John Templeton Foundation and the Resuscitation Council UK that I'd like to thank, but we also had support from the NIHR in the UK and our Department of Medicine uh, at NYU. I'm personally also funded by the NIH, but that was not used for this study. Uh, the equipment that I'll be talking about was loaned to us by Known in Medical and, and Massimo. However, they had no role in the design or any other aspect of the study. Um, we've heard a lot about different aspects of cardiac arrest research, and I'm certainly interested in all of these. If you wanted to break them up, we'd look at the different predictors of what may cause a cardiac arrest. A lot of our efforts are focused on resuscitation and trying to restart the heart. Also recognizing the need to treat the brain and avoid brain injury and the post-cardiac arrest syndrome. But I think one of the areas that's somewhat neglected is actually recognizing that there is a human being in there, that the patients that we're treating have a mind and a consciousness. And so, so the question is really what happens to the brain and consciousness in people who are going through cardiac arrest? And I think clearly that must have a relationship with the overall survival, survivalship uh, in these patients. And so what I'm going to be focusing on is research in this particular area. Um, if you look at the literature, there isn't much published on psychological outcomes in cardiac arrest patients. What you typically hear are things like post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety. And you can see sort of prevalence of 20 to 50% in survivors. Uh, there's also a group who have what I call positive psychological outcomes. These are people who end up with more gratitude, more, more resilience, uh, more altruism. And they typically have described this in the context of having had experiences during their cardiac arrest. But that's really all that we know. But certainly if you look at this kind of concept, you'll see that there are different things that are described in the literature about what happens during cardiac arrest. One of which has come into the fore is the concept of CPR-induced consciousness. This is essentially when practitioners observe signs of consciousness in people, groaning, rolling, moving. Um, and from the descriptions we have, and there's very little on it, it's about 1% that has been described. The other type of sort of conscious experience that occurs are actually patients' own perceptions of being conscious and lucid, in effect with heightened consciousness, observing hearing resuscitation attempts on them, and even having a sort of a transcendent experience. And you may have heard of people who describe sort of deceased relatives or seeing a light and so on. Um, that has also been described in about 10 to 20%. Um, and some of those people have, as I said, described sort of watching events going on. And there are other themes that have been described which we can't really categorize and don't know too much about. But certainly, if you look at the literature, it suggests that there must be some consciousness or awareness going on during cardiac arrest. And so we really tried to test the hypothesis, essentially, that consciousness or awareness is going on during cardiac arrest. And there may be explicit recall of events, but also not forgetting the concept of implicit learning, that is, unconscious learning. In other words, you can't remember it, but if we trigger your memory, you'll be able to then recall that you had actually had consciousness present. And that's been shown in studies during general anesthesia to be present. And we think that that may be related to the quality of brain resuscitation. So the primary aim of this project was to first of all understand the breadth of cognitive themes that people have um, that relate to their awareness as well as their memories in cardiac arrest survivors. And secondarily, we wanted to see whether we could install tests, independent tests to determine consciousness and awareness, particularly implicit learning in patients, together with brain monitoring systems to understand what's happening in the brain in real time while patients are having resuscitation. And in particular, EEG markers. So um, if you look at this, we had to sort of design this in an unorthodox manner. We had predominantly a prospective study that I'm going to describe. But recognizing that a prospective study is not ideal for low survival states like cardiac arrest, unfortunately, as we've heard, uh, we also combined this with a cross-sectional arm knowing that there are many survivors in the community that we could talk to to understand about the themes that they've recalled. Within the prospective arm, we installed brain monitoring systems, tests of explicit recall and implicit learning during the cardiac arrest. And then among the survivors, we conducted interviews. And as I said, we combined that later on with the cross-sectional group. So in terms of brain monitoring, uh, we use brain oximetry uh, together with a portable EEG device that is frontotemporal, four-lead EEG that's placed on the forehead. Uh, all of our staff were equipped with a bag that had these pieces of equipment in them, and they were notified of the time of cardiac arrest, and they had to get there within about five minutes and then install these devices without interrupting chest compressions. 
In terms of testing um, um, consciousness and awareness, we had a tablet, as you'll see here, um, uh, installed in the room that with a Bluetooth headphone that would deliver audio-visual cues to the patients so we could later test them to see if they'd had any recall. And here's the, test, the team trying out the system. You'll see there are four different devices, EEG, brain oximetry, headphones, um, and the tablet. Uh, in terms of patient recruitment, um, in, we had 2,400 patients roughly eligible within the, the group uh, of hospitals who participated. As you can recognize, it's a very challenging study to do and recruit patients. Uh, but we nonetheless managed to recruit almost 25%, uh, 24% uh, of the population, which is 567 patients. The reasons why patients were not included was often to do with staff not being able to get the cardiac arrest within time because they had to get there within roughly five minutes. Sometimes devices were being used on other patients and uh, sometimes patients were found to be futile and so CPR was stopped and various other issues that go on. Uh, we had a, a return of spontaneous circulation rate of 37% and a 10% survival to discharge. Please recognize that these are patients who've had at least five minutes of CPR. These are not your sort of quick shocks. So the survival rate is standard for that population, actually. Um, and of those uh, 28, so out of 53 people, were able to undergo interviews in the prospective arm, uh, and uh, the remainder were too sick. Uh, among the group who survived, what we found is a, a breadth of consciousness and recollection. So 39% of people reported broad perceptions and memories. These were not necessarily being able to recall specific events, but they felt that they had been conscious or had specific memories. If you then broke this down further, 20% of the, the group who survived had a transcendent experience uh, regarding their, con their cardiac arrest. 7% of these, uh, and I'm gonna talk about that in a moment, 7% of the experiences were more compatible with CPR-induced consciousness. You'll see what I mean in a moment uh, with that. 7% had perceptions of auditory awareness and hearing different things, discussions, and 3.5% had visual awareness. So what cognitive themes did we find? We analyzed these using grounded theory, and we found that here, so CPR-induced consciousness, um, essentially people, um, each of those lines that you see, this is a Schenke chart, each line is a specific patient, and what you see is that they describe events related to chest compression, so feeling the compressions, feeling the defibrillation, feeling the pain, hearing sounds of doctors talking around them. You can see clearly here that the population actually uh, clustered very nicely into these four broad themes. And so based upon that, we were able to deduce that these patients had CPR-induced consciousness. In other words, they were recalling real events related to their chest compressions, CPR. Um, we recognize also that if you interview patients post-cardiac arrest, we shouldn't forget that they end up in the ICU for some period of time. So uh, they start to emerge out of their coma. And so a number of things that they talk about actually relate to emergence out of coma in the ICU. And again, you'll see here that the descriptions actually cluster very beautifully together into specific themes. The themes being, for example, waking up uh, feeling confused, uh, waking up to pain, uh, waking, you know, having uh, understanding of being in the ICU and so on. So these are very specific themes that relate to that. What we also noticed is that there are delusional experiences that occur, and these are usually when patients are sort of in this twilight zone, where they're not fully out of their coma, and so they misattribute things that we do to them. If you're trying to prevent them from taking their ET tube out, they think they're being attacked by demons. And so just recognize that that's another category of experiences that occur when people are emerging out of coma. Now, one of the other things that we found, which again, and you'll see here, the clustering is very strong, is this recalled experience of death. These are essentially people's perceptions of having died and come back again. So this is a recollection you may have heard in the media, but this is something we found in our group. And this involves the different features, particularly you'll see having a review of their lives and re-examining all their actions, thoughts, and intentions towards other people in a complete manner that they come back and tell us about. Other features are a perception of being able to watch doctors and nurses resuscitating them, separating and watching things, uh, together with sort of a perception of going to a beautiful place, as well as having to come back. But particularly, there's a lucid reevaluation of their lives. And this was very different to other patients who had dreams or dreamlike experiences. You see that these do not cluster. These are just random themes that show up that people talk about. For example, watching a 1940s movie character. You know, nothing to do with any of these. So that's how we were able to parse out the different types of experiences that patients have. 
And just to show you that particular sort of life review, I think it's important and, and interesting to see. Here's somebody who says, you know, these are different people. I was given a life review. During the review, we revisit scenes from our lives. Another person said, I saw my entire life in great detail and experienced feelings through it of satisfaction, shame, repentance. Another person said, it was then that all my memories flooded back into my head, what I had done and what I thought. And finally, another person said, I then saw things in rapid succession that were moments of my life. Now, I also mentioned we wanted to find out if there are any biomarkers of consciousness in these patients. I'm just going to show you my last couple of slides. We collected EEG on patients, and we found, interestingly, although most of the time that the EEG was flat during cardiac arrest, you got these spikes of essentially normal EEG activity occurring. You have alpha waves, delta, theta. We also have gamma waves that occur. These are sort of high frequency that are usually associated with conscious thought processes, recall of memories, and so on and so forth. And so you, you hear, see here the frequency of the different images that we saw uh, between these different types. And that was very, very interesting to us because it seemed to be a marker of these conscious episodes going on in the brain. And so putting it all together, I think cardiac arrest patients that you talk to afterwards form different memories that are occurring and that are different. And these occur either during the cardiac arrest or in the post-ICU setting. You also remember that there are problems with interpretation when you talk to people. <laughs> And just so finally, I think we can conclude that there is a spectrum of consciousness and awareness going on in patients. Some of these, like CPR-induced consciousness, may relate to post-traumatic stress disorder. We think that the recalled experience of death is different to delusions, illusions, or hallucinations. Clearly, we need larger studies to test implicit learning. Our sample size was small. We had one case uh, that worked. Uh, there are electrocortical markers suggestive of lucid consciousness up to 60 minutes into cardiac arrest which suggests the brain has the recoverability. And finally, what I think is fascinating is that it looks like as the brain is shutting down during cardiac arrest, you're getting a disinhibition of certain parts. But then the question is, you get these sort of, sort of spikes of EEG activity. And what we don't understand is, how is it that's allowing you to get access to all of your memories, consciousness, your thoughts, everything that's happened to you throughout your life with a focus on morality and ethics, which we can't explain. But it is one of the mysteries of consciousness that we're observing in this population. With that, I'd like to finish, and thank you very much for your attention. And just to thank our team, our sites, uh, and also our, our other investigators. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cornea. This study is now open for questions, comments. Hi, my name is Esther Pratt from Copenhagen. Congratulations on the study. Very interesting. Um, how many of these patients were in intensive delirium? Did you examine that? How many patients had delirium, you're yeah. asking me? Um, the delirium actually we identified in the cross-sectional arm. These were the community survivors. So these were a, um, a group of patients who were sort of self-selected because they came forward to us. I didn't look at the exact frequencies. We just characterized the themes and divided them into groups. We didn't find them in the prospective arm, though. But there were very, you know, 28 survivors only in the prospective arm. Thank you. Uh, great study. Uh, Art Moskowitz from Monica Medical Center of Disclosures. Um, curious if you looked at uh, the cultural context of some of these memories. If there were differences across different cultures, what people were remembering for certain themes, or is it sort of consistent across all cultures, or is that something that you're looking at in the future? That's a very good question. Actually, these recollections are universal. They've been described. It's just that there haven't been enough studies in them. One of the things that's fascinating is, is that people do focus on their morality and ethics, but actually they don't focus on cultural issues when they're having their life review or religious issues, which is very interesting. None of them, nobody says, for example, how often I went to church or how often I went to temple. But there's a pure focus on their uh, morality and ethics and how they conduct themselves towards others, which we can't explain. Why should that happen when somebody's dying and their brain is shutting down and we're doing chest compressions on them? But it seems to occur. Thank you. We probably only have time for one of the three questions. Eric, uh, oh, sorry, I just was going to say, could the three of you decide? <laughs> <laughs> By consensus only, we're going to defer to Melissa, Dr. Parker. My question is simple. What should we do about it? I, I, that's a difficult question. <laughs> I, I, think one is, uh, I think one is that we should recognize that this phenomenon occurs in patients. Uh, and two, to be able to be more open, to be able to counsel people and educate our colleagues about it. I think that that's a question maybe you're alluding to is if you have incidents of CPR-induced consciousness, should we sedate people? I don't know. That's a difficult question. But certainly I think there are some people who are 
at risk of post-traumatic stress disorder because of things that we're doing in, in good intent for them. Great. Thank you very much.